Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for viewing tonight's Sloth Conservation event. We're so excited to have the founder and director of the Green Heritage Fund, Suriname, here tonight, Monique Poole. I'm Marianne. I'm an event planner for the library. Before we start, I just wanted to share that this project was made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. You can let us know if you, how much you enjoy tonight's event, we will be dropping the survey link in the comments. You can also please let us know what you would like to see for upcoming virtual events. We would love to hear from you and greatly appreciate the feedback. Some exciting news about library events going on right now, including this event tonight, is part of our adult summer reading program. You can sign up for that via Beanstack. We're also going to drop that link in the comments as well. OCLS card, card holders 18 and older can participate in our adult summer reading program for the chance to win digital badges and really cool prizes. So be sure to check that out. Again, those links will be dropped in the comments. So Thank you so much everyone for watching and thank you for Monique for presenting. I'm super excited to learn more about sloths and sloth conservation from Monique Poole. Monique is the founder and director of the Green Heritage Fund in Suriname. She is also a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature Species Survival Commission, that's IUCN slash SSSC, Anteater, Sloth, and Armadillo Specialist Group. And she's also a member of the ICUCN SSC Serena um, Specialist Group. So Monique is so incredibly busy and with conservation and so involved in so many different things with outside of the Green Heritage Fund Suriname. So we're very, very happy that she made the time for us tonight to talk about sloth conservation. If you would like to learn more about the Green Heritage Fund in Suriname, we'll be also dropping that link in the comments as well. So Monique, I'm gonna bring you onto the stream. Hello, I hope you're having a great evening and thank you so much for presenting tonight. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, before anything else, uh, good evening, everybody. It's a, a, a privilege to be here. Um, I would like to thank Marianne for, uh, from Orange County Library too, for inviting me and hosting this, ev this event. And I would like to thank Holly Ray Flickinger, a volunteer uh, who's worked with us, who made this con connection. So I'm grateful to be part of the IUCN uh, uh, Sinatra Specialist Group and uh, thank all our fellow volunteers, the Nature Conservation Division in Suriname, our partner, Well to Shoots Gesellschaft, and all our donors who are helping to make our work possible. And uh, once more, I thank the Orange County Library for inviting me to share the work we do in Suriname uh, with others. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have questions for Monique, oh, excuse me, Monique, she'll be answering those at the end of her presentation. So you can place those in the comments for Monique. Um, if you could please share your presentation and I will add that to the screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Mariana. So to start with, I wasn't trained as a biologist or a veterinary doctor. Uh, but I've been working with Sinatrans in Suriname for the past 15 years. And so for that reason, I prefer to refer to myself as a naturalist. And next to helping Sinatrans, uh, my most important mission is to change people's minds and attitudes towards all Sinatrans uh, in, living in Suriname by connecting them to these animals and the habitats in which they live in a manner that impacts these people's soul and spirit rather than their mind. So with the work we do, we actually also help uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, so goal three, good health and well-being. And when I look at these goals, we don't just think from this human perspective because 
I think we all have to realize that the health of the environment and the animals living in it is intrinsically related to human health and well-being. And so for that reason, we focus in our work uh, on what is called wildlife welfare and individual animal welfare of the animals we work with, and not exclusively on conservation. And this is part of what is called One Health, One Welfare. So quality education is goal number four. We, we are involved in educating in formal and informal settings about the animals we work with and the habitats in which they live. Um, with regard to sustainable cities and communities, cities without green are not sustainable. And you will understand better why uh, we are working on this goal uh, further down in my presentation. Climate action. Our animals are directly impacted by climate change, as I will explain to you later in my presentation. And we are actively working on climate change actions. So, of course, we work with goal 15, which is life on land. All extant Xenatrans are land-dwelling animals. Uh, this group includes sloths, anteaters, and armadillos and is one of the basal clades of placental mammals. So these animals are almost all exclusively South American, with the exception of one, and that is the nine-banded armadillo, which is also occurring in the south of North America. And this superorder has a fossil history of at least 65 million years. And I think everybody knows uh, Sid from uh, Ice Age. <laughs> So uh, goal number 17, of course, without partnerships, like for example, with uh, our German partner, Wealthy Schutzgesellschaft, but also partnering with the Orange County Library, we won't achieve the goals that, that we want to achieve. So before I start telling you a little bit more about uh, slots, I, I will want to tell you where is Suriname. So Suriname is located in the region known as Amazonia, and more in particular is part of the Guyana Shield. And you can see the white line, which is the uh, boundary of where the Guyana Shield is uh, located. And the Guyana Shield lies, underlies all of northeastern South America and covers a broad area between the Atlantic Ocean, the Orinoco, and the Amazon River. And it is shared between Brazil, French Guiana, Suriname, Guyana, Venezuela, and Colombia. And is one of the oldest, most stable geologic formations in the world. Suriname is still covered in lush, pristine rainforest. Uh, we have mostly pristine forest in 90 93% yet of our territory, which is uh, quite amazing. And since this is a library event, I would like to read something for you from a publication from 1667. Uh, and it is an impartial description of Suriname upon the continent of Guyana in America, with the history of several strange beasts, birds, fishes, serpents, insects, and customs of that colony. And it was written by George Warren. And he writes about the sloth. He says, the sloth is a creature so called from the dullness of his nature, somewhat bigger than a baboon and of various colors. He is so stupid that neither shouts nor blows will make him mend his pace considerably, which one may imagine is none of the swiftest when if not disturbed, He'll make it a day's journey in climbing up a tree from whence he rarely descends till there is nothing left to feed upon. And then, moved more by necessity than choice, he very gravely travels down that and up another where he sits spending those idle hours, which are not many he can spare from eating and sleep in whistling such tunes as himself is too lazy. And I believe nobody else would think good enough to dance after. So that's 
something from a very old publication about slots. And I hope that with my presentation, I will be able to uh, dispel some of these uh, very negative ideas about slots, about them being lazy and um, dumb, etc. So we have two species of sloth in, in Suriname. There are in total six species and uh, they are quite different from, from each other. So the pale-throated three-fingered sloth or Bradypus tridactylus, which you see a baby here. And here is a, a mother with a baby. And here another mother with a baby. They, they're quite cute actually to see. And I personally find our tree, the pale throat, the tree fingered slot, uh, very um, cute animals. Um, and this is a, a male. You can see in this, the spot in his back that it's a male. These animals don't have this um, sexual um, um, differentiation until they become one year old. And so before their first year, basically, you don't know whether you have a baby male or female until this, this spot starts uh, showing. So this is one species that we have. And the other species is called Linnaeus two-fingered sloth. And um, this is a baby and another baby at our center. Here's a, a baby with the mother. They are feeding somewhere. It was somewhere in the middle of the city. We, we removed them. The, uh, the people uh, called us to, to uh, remove these animals. And as you can see, um, I for me, they look very different. And I know that not everybody will see this, but the two-fingered slot has very um, sharp teeth. And uh, they're quite aggressive, can be much faster than... Um, the, the other one. And uh, whenever people talk about slots, they say, you, you know, it's like saying, uh, sometimes they call us and they say, oh, we have a baby slot here. And then it appears to be the three fingered one, but they, they're a little bit, they're quite, quite a bit smaller than the, the two fingered slots. Um, and it would be like saying that, you know, I found a chihuahua and saying that um, the chihuahua is a baby Great Dane. Uh, that's the type of difference you make. So, so sloth is not a species. And so I find often on the internet, there's a lot of literature and there they make it into as if it's one species while the two-fingered slots and the three-fingered slots are quite different from each other um, in their uh, whole um, behavior and everything. So it's really like uh, comparing uh, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. And of course, as I said, in a library event, not all slots are created e equal. And I, I wanted to read to you uh, a very famous um, uh, poem uh, that was written by Theodor Rutke, and I'm probably not pronouncing his last name very well, but it is a um, very well-known poem. In moving slow, he has no peer. You ask him something in his ear. He thinks about it for a year. And then before he says a word, there, upside down, unlike a bird, he will assume that you have heard a most exasperating look. But should you call his manner smug, he'll sigh and give his branch a hug. Then off again to sleep he goes, still swaying gently by his toes. And you just know he knows. And the slot that you see here in the picture is actually a three-fingered slot. And I think when this poem was written, this was the species that it was written for. Um, as you can see, this animal is actually sunning. They, they need to sun themselves uh, because their, their metabolism is so slow um, that they need to they need the sun to be able to keep that temperature um, 
at a certain level. So where do these uh, species occur? So the Bradypus tridactylus, and I, I'm on purpose putting a, a picture up, um, is found only on the, actually within the boundaries of that Guyana shield. So it has a very limited uh, distribution. And it's really important for us to know about this because um, when you think it is found in the whole of South America, you take different measures for these animals. In my country, this species is uh, fully protected. And uh, this is not true in the complete range of this animal. So then the distribution of the uh, Colopus deductilis, the two-fingered sloth, is a little bit beyond that uh, Guyana shield that I was talking about. And um, this, they're not really sure yet about if there's just two species of two-fingered slot, because at this moment, we think there's only two species. But we may find, because they suspect there's one that is found in the... Um, the high uh, in the mountains in Colombia, that it may actually not be the same uh, Colopus didactylus. So this is the question I often get, uh, because most of our rescues, 95% of our rescues are done, are, are actually found from the city. And so I often get uh, the question, so slots wander into the city? And I said, no, 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 that's really the wrong um, impression. We actually wandered into their habitat. We started living where uh, they live, uh, where the distribution um, is most likely to occur. And this map that you see on the screen, where it's red, that, will, that, that indicates that is the place where you will find the highest there's all circumstances there are actually favorable for these animals to be there. And this actually is completely in line with um, what we find because 95% of our rescues are from the city. And I'm highlighting it a little bit. Um, th this um, modeling was done, but it's not completely correct. Because um, as you can see, um, in Guyana, it's supposed to be a very high uh, probability of finding uh, these animals. But what was not taken into account is the fact that there's no forest cover left in that part of Guyana. So you wouldn't find that many uh, three-fingered slots in, uh, this was specifically done for three-fingered slots. Um, so this type of modeling needs to be done again with more uh, parameters in there. So what are the threats that these animals face in Suriname? Um, killing or capturing. This is a, a picture from Facebook where uh, a two-fingered slot was killed. This is illegal. Let me make, make that clear. It's illegal to do this. Uh, people eat it, but it's not allowed. It's, it's really, um, they can go to jail for this. Um, the expanding urban area and land conversion in rural areas is another threat that they are facing. Then we have a problem with pet wildlife conflict. Both animals that you see here were in contact with dogs. Uh, one uh, had a broken arm. She stayed with us for almost two months, um, but her arm healed completely. Uh, and she um, recovered and was uh, released. The other animal you see, unfortunately, did not make it. Uh, the, she was hurt by the uh, dogs and um, unfortunately died. Then infrastructure is a problem. Uh, we're talking about roads, uh, power lines and houses because for whatever reason, we had the recent um, rescue where we found an animal sitting actually in the kitchen next to a big pot. And uh, 
it was really uh, fortunate that the people where, where she was found thought that um, she should be saved and should you know, be um, released again. And so we went and we, we, we removed this animal from the kitchen of these people. And then the other problem is forest fragmentation in urban areas. We have a lot of forest uh, that is removed because of um, the um, uh, yeah, urban urbanization, which is really a, a problem. We, we are really encroaching on their uh, habitat, on their best habitat. And then there's a decrease in floral biodiversity. Um, where you see this line in my uh, slide, that is a piece of uh, original um, marsh forest, which has a higher biodiversity um, than the land that is next to it, which was a um, former agricultural plot of land, which has then become uh, overgrown again because the people uh, didn't use it anymore for agricultural land. So in a picture, um, in a satellite picture, it looks like there's still forest, but this forest is definitely not the same. And you will not find the animals in the degraded forest. Uh, they will have a lot less forest left where they can uh, stay. So I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in 2012. We did a big uh, slot rescue. And this uh, slot rescue um, was quite uh, unique. It was uh, only 6.8 hectare of um, land in the middle of the city. And um, as you can see, this is uh, Paramaribo. And the uh, yellow um, pins uh, indicate where this um, uh, plot of land was of 6.8 hectare. Uh, we worked there for um, uh, almost uh, two months on and off. We had a good collaboration with the Nature Conservation Division, with game wardens, with lots of volunteers, with the owner of the land, with the operator of the machines to help remove these animals. And it was the Animal Protection Society who had actually um, told us about this. And they said, we have counted 13 slots. Do you want to uh, remove them before they um, uh, deforest this this forest fragment and we said yes i had never seen more than six slots uh, at the time because i had six slots at that moment in the shelter and the shelter was actually my house basically my bathroom and um, so i was thinking okay six um, is a lot uh, 13 is even more but we will be able to find a solution um, so, so we did, and uh, the first day, uh, two of the uh, volunteers who were helping, and I'm just showing this where, um, this, is, this is where uh, they are pushing the tree over, and you will see an animal in the tree. It is quite amazing how these animals survive that um, it was um, but but you know I was asked by somebody how can you do this how can you stand there and watch and I told her I can't do anything about the deforestation because it's private land the owner has been willing to work with us so um, this is the next best thing we can do, that is to, to collect them and bring them to a place where they are safe. 
And this was all done, uh, you know, together with volunteers, with uh, animals. This is, as it's progressing, you can see um, the forest is uh, disappearing uh, uh, slowly. Um, we were standing there the whole day from eight o'clock in the morning until six at night. And where we thought we were going to rescue 13 animals, we ended up saving 130 um, three-fingered slots. And then there were other animals that we rescued. There were uh, two-fingered slots as well. This is a two-fingered slot with a baby, as you can see. Uh, we rescued, um, uh, this is a Brazilian porcupine. Uh, we also rescued those. And the reason is all other animals are fast. Um, and I'm talking about monkeys, birds, snakes, um, you name it, all the other animals move very fast. Porcupines, sloths, and there's one anteater, and that is the, the silky anteater. They are not fast. And so they will remain in the tree until it gets cut down. And that's why uh, those are the animals we mostly uh, rescued. We, um, uh, to make sure that they were not too traumatized, we uh, put them in um, uh, bags, big bags together. Um, we, we were sometimes taking 15 animals home per day. Um, as you can see, um, adults as well as um, babies. Uh, one, I think there was one day where I had 50 animals sitting in and around my house. Here you see how uh, two of the volunteers were uh, taking down one of the animals that, that uh, was still, they, they, they continued to very, to hold on to the branches very well. Um, and then we had these little ones and we didn't know how to match them up. At this moment, I would know how to do it uh, much better than before. Uh, we've gained so much more experience in the past uh, years uh, with slot rehabilitation. Um, but then we didn't know. Uh, so we kept the baby separate and were uh, giving them milk. We also uh, took the opportunity to weigh all animals and um, take some measurements so that from, I think in total 60 animals, we also uh, um, took blood samples for genetic analysis uh, because we don't do sufficient research. And without this research and data, um, these animals will continue to be um, of least concern for the IUCN. And um, when they are data deficient, you cannot give them a status. And so you cannot take good conservation measures. So this is a really important uh, thing. So we did all types of measurements. Um, there were some animals that were hurt, not a lot. Uh, and for that, the, the vet came to help um, clean the wounds uh, every so often. We uh, numbered the animals as well, uh, and we took pictures of their faces. This, these are um, two of the females were inside my house with a lot of the babies. They were like surrogate mothers. And um, this, is, this was a very good solution, but I have the experience now that not this is not always possible. Not all females will accept um, to do this. Um, we also tag them so that uh, when we release the animals, we could uh, take pictures and match up the pictures with um, the animals' uh, measurements. So that was a little bit about this uh, 2012 slot rescue. If you want to read more about it, we wrote a paper and it's uh, called Slots in the City, Unexpectedly High Density of Pale Throat to Tree Toad Slots Found in an Urban Forest Patch in Paramaribo. The uh, amount of slots um, that we found in such a small area was many, many times um, 
what had been found in previous studies. So it was a really interesting um, um, rescue. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about was about Sinatrans and climate change. And uh, we found in 2019, there was a very high mortality and disease in rescued Sinatrans in early 2019 in Greater Paramaribo. And for you, a picture that I'm showing here is probably not unusual because um, depending on where you live, uh, you have seasons. And um, during winter, you will see uh, fallen leaves. Well, in my country, I live in a tropical country where uh, we have basically um, no seasons where uh, the trees will drop their leaves and then after some time, the leaves will come back. You have certain trees that do that, like the kapok tree will drop all its leaves and then it will relieve again. But that it's unusual, uh, you know, it's not like, well, this, what you see here is, is very unusual. We had in total uh, 30 um, days of um, very bad uh, dry weather. And before that, I never could imagine why, um, of how climate change would affect the animals we work with. But not only did we have this incredible drought, there were also more fires. And we also had some um, um, whirlwinds uh, that broke the forest. So two things were happening. Um, more um, strong winds, um, more fires, and so such a drought that the leaves fell off the trees. Well, if you know that the, the animals I work with are folly fours, or they only ate leaves, when the leaves don't have the sufficient moisture and they fall off the trees, the animals will die. And that, that is what was happening. So we started getting in uh, rescues. We normally get three rescues a week uh, over the year on average, but at this, a particular uh, moment in time, we were receiving three animals per day. And most of them were very debilitated, uh, very sick. Um, we also thought uh, we, we got a lot of babies. Um, actually, all the babies died. Um, we think the mothers decided to skip um, a reproduction, reproductive cycle and abandon their babies. Um, here you see one of those babies, we, we were trying to uh, keep it alive. Um, any animal that came in was really eager to drink. This animal had been attacked by a dog because if there is less uh, food available, they will come to the ground and start migrating to other places to find food. And of course, as soon as they come to the ground, they will uh, be at risk of getting in contact with uh, dogs and other dangerous uh, cars and you know humans, um, all, all dangerous to them. Um, we had a very exceptional case of an animal that had fallen out of a tree. That is also very unusual. Slots don't fall out of trees. Um, but it all happened within this very short uh, period of uh, 30, um, it was 90 days of a really bad drought in 2019. What you also saw in the animals is that their eyes would uh, be, um, uh, they would have eye infections, also related, of course, to the fact that they had um, less uh, moisture. And of course, they couldn't clean their eyes, no um, you know, they were dehydrated, so it was difficult for their eyes to um, stay moisturized. Another animal also with uh, eye infection. So um, that's a little bit about the work that we've done and, and the threats that we're um, facing. Uh, what you see here is um, a beautiful building, which is now our slot rehabilitation center. If you think of the fact that all the work that I uh, used to do for um, between 2005 and 
2017 was all from my house and my house was in the city. So I had all these animals always around my house, in my house. Um, and of course that was not ideal. Um, and so my big wish was to have a center close to the forest. And since 2017, we were able to move to this center uh, thanks to uh, the CNN Heroes um, uh, Award that I was given. I was able to fundraise and we purchased a private piece of forest, a beautiful um, marsh forest that is similar to the forest of the coast. This, this center is uh, located uh, an hour's uh, drive uh, from the city. So the other work, of course, we continue doing uh, now on daily basis are rescues. Um, when this happens, like I find animals in the high wires, of course, I don't do that myself. I call the energy company and they help me remove these animals. I also work a lot with the fire brigade and uh, also the police and the zoo um, refer all uh, rescues of sloths, anteaters and armadillos to us. So this, this is an a anteater with the mother. Um, so as I said, we do three rescues on average per week. Um, and the other thing is, um, once we find an animal that is in need of care, it will get animal care. We work with um, eight different uh, veterinary doctors. We provide training to them um, so that they also know because a slot have such a different uh, metabolism and anteaters as well that um, the veterinary doctors need to be trained to be able to give um, uh, good care, the proper care to these animals. Um, as I said, this uh, animal uh, had uh, stayed with us for six weeks and uh, then was um, released again and everything went fine. Um, we release all the animals. Um, once an animal comes in, if nothing is wrong, if it's just sort of a um, in the wrong location, so to say, because it sits, for example, like I said, in somebody's kitchen, then um, we can immediately release it. It doesn't need to be checked by the, the veter veterinary doctors because they are healthy. They are solitary animals, so they also don't need to be adjusted and taught how to live in the wild. Because they are wild, we can immediately um, place them in a new location. Um, and we don't need to socialize them in a new group. Fortunately, where we have our center, that is a location where there is a lot of forest still that is not under threat of urbanization. So um, that, that makes it really uh, a good location for us to release these animals. This is a, also a release of an anteater with baby. Anteaters are amazing animals as well. Um, and I, I guess it requires a whole different uh, uh, presentation to tell you more about anteaters and the species we have in Suriname. So other work we do is uh, work on education. Um, we have different types of uh, educational outreach projects. This is at the, our center itself. We do tours. Um, people can come and visit. And so if you ever have the opportunity, come and visit Suriname and visit our center. Um, and we'll provide you with a tour where you can see the animals actually living in the forest. Another thing uh, we've um, started doing is we are working together, as I said, we form partnerships, working together with um, two game developers. And I'm just. So this game. 
game is about a slot that has a special ability and he needs to go and save the forest that is, has become ill. And he can do that, but of course he has a lot of barriers that he encounters on the way there. And, and that, that game is um, developed, the game developers um, provide um, this, you can purchase this game on, on uh, different types of uh, um, uh, platforms. And the idea is that gaming can actually have a good, um, a good outcome. So they wanted to create a game in which people or, or young people do something to save the forest and they learn about uh, the forest environment of slots. So another thing we want to do in the future is uh, create a slot action plan. That is something that would help us um, protect these animals so that instead of having um, a status within the IUCN of data deficient, we can actually um, determine how these animals will be affected by climate change and by all the other threats and how they are doing and how we can help um, protect them so that they will continue to be able to survive and be healthy also. So that's something that we are planning for the future. So I think uh, that ends my presentation. I hope I didn't speak too long. Um, and this, this picture actually is something special I want to tell you about. On the left, you see um, a two-fingered slot. On the right, there is a three-fingered slot. The three-fingered slot is a male, and males don't um, normally care for young. But this male um, was caring for a two-fingered uh, baby was quite a unique uh, situation and um, we thought it was um, yeah a very very exceptional uh, thing and it helped the baby to um, develop into a normal adult more or less normal of course <laughs> so these are some references I've used for this um, presentation. And so if there are any questions, um, I would be happy to, um, to share, um, yeah, to, to answer questions that you have. Um, now. Thank you Thanks so much, Monique. If you do have questions for Monique, you can place those in the comments. My first question is, was that sloth in the last or the previous picture um, actually using the bathroom? Yes, actually, <laughs> let, me, let me go back there. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, no, no, okay. I'm going to add it back to yes, the stream. So this animal, this, this animal uh, was brought in and um, all the animals were staying in a, a big bathroom I, I had. And she was there and uh, one day we came into the bathroom and we saw her sitting in there. And we were like, what is happening? And when we looked into the, 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 the toilet, we saw that she had actually defecated. And, and this was really uh, strange. So we thought it was a coincidence. But after the third and the fourth time that she had done it, we realized that she probably had been somebody's pet, oh. which is illegal, as I said. They are not, yeah. you know, you, you, you're not allowed to keep them as pets. Um, but somebody had apparently taught her to use the toilet because wow. she would every time when she needed to go to the toilet, she would go in there, defecate, and then climb out again. So it was a really unique uh, animal. Wow. That's incredible. This, this presentation has... 
so wonderful. Like Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we have a question. Oh, sorry. I will <laughs> take that off. Sorry. Which I'm, one? I'm little... um, sorry. Ah, yes. I think oh I'm <laughs> Is it good like this? Yes. Could I stop perfect. sharing or it's OK? OK. Oh, you're good. I um, removed the screen from, so it's just us. Yeah. OK. Which one Great. do you save more, the two fingers or three fingers loss? So um, we still save more three finger slots as this, at this moment. Um, when I started out, I think for the first four or five years, we almost never had two finger slots. But now we, we see that we get a lot more of the two finger slot. Two finger slots are really fast aggressive they will not sit and le just let you you know like remove them uh they will actually try to bite you the, i i have some war wounds so to say <laughs> um because as i as you saw they have very sharp teeth and they fast so all this this idea about them being dumb and slow mm -hmm. as i said a slot is not a species. There are six different species, and the three-fingered and the two-fingered slots are like, you know, like making comparison between a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Yeah, that is so interesting. I didn't realize that the, you know, that one was faster than the other. And yeah. <laughs> um, so kind of a follow-up to that uh, when we saw the sloth in the bathroom. So. What was it like having sloths in your in your home? And do they get into things like you know other animals would? So I I don't like having animals in cages. And so um, what I did, they were basically living in my house, um, and we would take them outside to defecate. Um, so. Oh yeah, something interesting that I didn't share yet with you. Uh, Three-fingered sloth uh, only defecate once a week. And so the only reason they come down from a tree is to defecate. And so they would not normally, um, uh, if they are in a tree, they will migrate from tree to tree. Um, they will not come down from one tree and then go up another one. That's not the way they, they move. So that also shows that this uh, fragment that I read for you from 1667 was very in inaccurate because an animal would only come down to defecate. Um, now, coming back to your uh, question. So these animals were just living in my house. Um, and that means um, sometimes I would be sitting at my desk and an animal would come and uh, sit next to me. Um, there were three animals that stayed over from the 2012 because the mm -hmm. volunteers felt that we should track them. They said we invested so much in them. If you release them, we want to know how they're doing, but tracking is very expensive. And so these animals lived with us for five years. In 2017, we let them go. And of these three animals and one I have here on my shirt, which is Lucas, was the male. And uh, we have Lucas, Anne, and 19 November. 19 November is a name. It was the, the last baby slot rescued during the 2012 rescue on the 19th of November. And we were actually, no, we, we, we were lacking any fantasy to come up with a name. So we just decided to call the animal 19 November. Mom. Lucas and Anne left and went into the forest and we never seen them back. But 19 November stayed very close to the center and every year had a baby. And every year when she had a baby, she would come closer to us and show the baby. Oh. And Wow. Yeah, so so she was basically a success story because one thing was five years she was able to survive in my house. So it meant we gave her good care. She then successfully returned to the wild 
and was able to procreate. Unfortunately, at the beginning of this year, we found her dead, very close to one of the enclosures. And as she was communicating with us, I am convinced that even while she was dying, she wanted us to know that she was dying. So she died very close to where we would find her. Um, and I can now talk about this without emotion, but I, she was my best friend. Oh, I, I really <laughs> love the 19th of November. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that. That is, I understand why you're getting emotional. I Like, that's intense. Wow, I can't imagine like that, that bond. That's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you live with an animal for five years in your house yeah. and then she goes into the forest and she keeps this oh. contact with you, you know, yeah. keeps communicating. Uh, that is really exceptional. It also shows how intelligent they are. Yes. yes. Yeah. Like you raised me and now I'm showing you my, that's, that's a beautiful story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you have any questions for Monique, you can put those in the comments and she will answer those. I was curious, was the person's kitchen the most random place you've ever found a sloth or was there a different place that you found really interesting that you um, asked you to from? In most cases, a sloth doesn't like to be uh, low. Mm -hmm. So they will always try to go high high up somewhere. Um, so in terms of this animal sitting in a kitchen, that was quite unusual. But the strangest one I found was an animal that was also actually in a kitchen, but it had crawled under uh, a cabinet because normally they would go up. And so why would yeah. this animal go down? That was quite unusual. And, and so I had to crawl on the uh, on the floor and to try to get to extract it from that position it was quite yeah. uh, unusual as well yeah maybe like some leaves like <laughs> yeah so I, I, random <laughs> yeah <laughs> strange yeah um we do have another question comparing the description of sloths back then what would you change in the description sorry um um, start so, raining here. Oh, no. so, yes. So, the description that you shared earlier, what would you change to modernize that? Oh, well, f first of all, you know, the fact that they are describing sloth as one animal, mm -hmm. as I said, it's like, you know, describing a chihuahua and a great dane with one description. So that that is the first thing. Um, and then, of course, um, saying that it is slow and dumb and lazy, you know, they're very efficient. Um, as I mentioned in my, um, at the beginning, their fossil history is 65, at least 65 million years, which means they are incredibly um, efficient uh, of being able to have survived all this time. Um, and I already, I, I'm going to share another story with you. They're so intelligent that they can teach each other things. So these animals that were living in my bathroom, um, they, um, so I had animals that came in and you would leave again. And then I had Anne, Lucas and 19 November who had, you know, the use of my house, so to say. But the other animals would be staying in my bathroom. And at a certain moment, Anne discovered that there were slots in the bathroom. And so she taught herself to open the door and used to go inside when she wanted to visit with the animals in there. And not necessarily to, um, to because they are social, but because she had found out that we were putting food there as well. <laughs> And she would go in there so she could eat their food as well. <laughs> and she would, in the same way that she went in, she would open the door 
and come out again. <laughs> and then we found another animal that had not seen this and had not been in contact who also started opening the door. And so for us, it was quite uh, unusual because we, I don't think they talk to each other, or at least we don't know. Um, know. Maybe yeah. there's the telepathy. <laughs> but they had taught each other how to open the door. So we found ourselves having to lock the door because otherwise they would all be roaming in my yeah. house. <laughs> that's, that's so adorable that she was that food motivated. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, yeah, they're very food motivated. Oh, yes. I love that. Um, what was the name of the game that you mentioned? The slot it's, game? Oh, it, it's called Go Slow. Go Slow, okay. <laughs> yes. And it, you can uh, find it and, uh, on the, the different game platforms. And uh, the partnership that we have with the game developers and I'm very proud of this because the game developed, it's the very first game developed out of Suriname. Um, so these are two young guys that decided that they wanted to develop a game, but they wanted to make it something that had a positive educational impact and wanted it to about saving forests and uh, with the, you know, with the slot. So it's called mm -hmm. Go Slow. And uh, the, they donate part of the proceeds of this game to, to our foundation. That is so cool. I'm going to put um, your website up on the screen again. So uh, we're about close to the hour of the end of the program. The last question I have is, do you have any advice for anyone who is starting out and they want to um, be more active in conservation? Yeah, well, I think it's very telling the fact I'm a linguist by training. And so I, I've been teaching myself, reading, you know, what better uh, place to promote reading than during a library event. Um, reading a lot, uh, getting in contact with experts. If you really want to do something, don't wait for money, do it, take action. There's small actions you can take by liking people who do positive things for the environment by uh, starting to share with your family uh, and friends about positive actions for the environment. Um, yeah, and in other ways, promoting actions. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a very action-oriented uh, person, and that's why I started doing this, because you can, um, you know, see a slot crossing the road and just think, um, oh, wow, this animal is going to be hit by a car and just drive on. But because of the work we've been doing, we see now that more and more people actually stop the car, stop all traffic and help the animals cross the road. So those types of actions are the actions that we're looking for. And you can do that as well in Suriname, as well as in, um, the you know, wherever you live, you can help at taking actions. This was so remarkable. I, I just, it's mind blowing that you can find a sloth in someone's house. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I live in Orlando. We do not have that <laughs> type of issue here. This yeah. was, this was remarkable. I have learned so much from you and I just appreciate so much that you took the time to share your knowledge and, you know, bring us into your home and your sanctuary and to just, teach us more about sloth conservation. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Yes, well, thank you for hosting this and thank you for inviting me to share uh, the work we do. Um, and also being able to tell something about Suriname, a country, well, not very well known uh, across the world because we're so small and uh, we don't speak English. And so we were not very well known. So it's for me opportunity. Thank you, Marianne, for inviting me. And uh, I, I really enjoyed sharing my work with you. Thank you. I'm gonna put up your website one more time before we go. If you would like to learn more about the Green Heritage Fund of Suriname, you can visit greenfundsuriname.org.
We also have that link in the chat or comments as well. And I hope everyone is enjoying your summer so far. You can check out OCLS.info for all upcoming programs. One more time, thank you so much, Monique. I hope um, you have a wonderful rest of your evening and that will conclude tonight's program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.